It is Mojo Mojo Monday, Rick Hale. How are you? I'm awesome. Another installment of our favorite thing to do every single Monday. Absolutely. I wonder how many episodes this is. We got to be getting close to 100. We should we probably start be. counting. We uh, got to be. We are still in the Algebra Happiness by Scott Galloway. Um, we're actually, if you're following along in the book, we're on page 68 today. But this is going to be a fun topic. Uh, I love that this book is like a bunch of random uh, topics that kind of standalone conversations in a way. Um, but they all kind of roll up to this big theme of the algebra of happiness and, and how you find happiness through your pursuit or journey of life, right? Well, today's conversation, Rick, is really, I think he titled it, uh, You're Probably Not Mark Zuckerberg. Yet the better title to make sense of it all is, uh, what does a successful entrepreneur really mean? And just full disclosure, entrepreneur was one of those SAT words that I always struggled spelling uh, growing up. So we'll leave that there. But what is a successful entrepreneur? Well, I think it starts and stops with ability to have vision in some product or service but also taking on the responsibility of organizing and attracting talent to deliver that vision. Yeah. And so I, so just a second ago, I'm like, man, I ought to look up the technical definition. So according to the dictionary, it's a person who organizes and operates a business or businesses taking on greater than normal financial risks in order to do so. so okay. Th there you go. There's the technical definition. You know, I think, I think the reason he titled this section, uh, you're probably not Mark Zuckerberg, is we as as human beings, we kind of idolize success. And uh, obviously, there's some extreme cases like Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos that just went huge and big and billionaire, whatever you want to title it. Yet, uh, <laughs> is there really a formula to that? Um, there probably is actually, it just, they did it at a different level than other people. And if you don't think luck played a factor, I'm sure luck was and timing was, was in that formula somewhere, but, uh, the author Scott gave us four things today to discuss Rick Brown, kind of our check and balance of what being an entrepreneur is. And before we run through these, I really want you to comment or we can kind of talk through it, but. Um, being an entrepreneur is not for everybody, right? Like, uh, th th it, it, it's certainly not the only path. We tend to idolize the path, but it's not the only path. No, of course not. And, yeah. and you know, th there's personality profiles and tests. At Keller Williams, we have the Keller Personality Assessment. There's the DISC. There's the Johnson O'Connor. There's Abelson. There's countless. And yeah. Myers it's just not everyone's yeah. DNA to naturally not just assume risk, but to chase risk. There's a difference between the type of people that, you know, are like, all right, if under the right circumstance, I mean, I would put, you know, $5,000 on this investment or this opportunity and see what happens. And then there are people that mortgage their house, live out of their car. You know, it's like they die by the sword for success, for the vision they've crafted for an opportunity that's either a product or a service. So if I think it's important to get really clear who you are, what you are, why you are, and what are your skills, because if you're misaligned with an opportunity and it depletes your energy and creates stress, it's probably going to deplete your health and it's going to deplete relationships. Absolutely. So first is to get clear. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things about the U S economy and the U S industrial age, if you will, uh, that created some special uh, things about the United States is that we had these huge, big companies and corporations were uh, a big part of who we were as a company and people would succeed inside those corporate structures, um, yeah. which is not specifically entrepreneurship. That's actually uh, the corporate game, the corporate life. Yet uh, a lot of people thrive in that environment. But what we're talking about today is really more the standalone entrepreneurship environment. And the first test he he asked us in the book, and he said, can you sign the front, not the back of checks? Set that up for me. 
So the way I read into that is that, are you willing to take a risk, hire people? And you, you, I mean, your payroll, you are the payroll. And if the company's not generating payroll, which very few startups do for a season or you know, the length of time, that's a stressful place to be. People's lives are in the balance and their, yeah. you know, ability to pay their bills is only as good as your ability to write the, you know, sign the front of checks. Sure. And so it goes back to your DNA as well as having a product or service that's so exciting that people are willing to compromise and sacrifice for alongside you, because we all know no one succeeds alone. Yeah. I mean, to me, I, the same similar thought process, like if you're an entrepreneur, you you're running a business, right? And what are the things that you would sign the front of a check for? Well, a cost of sale, you would sign the front of a check for a cost of sale. You would sign the front of a check for an expense, which includes payroll, right? But yep. it also includes uh, all, all the stuff that causes the business to thrive, right? Um, and that you're hoping to get a return on investment from. And then there's probably some profit check that's being signed instead of you resigning the back of a check on revenue that's coming in. And you might sign those checks too, but there's a fundamental difference between just depositing uh, checks into your bank account where you're signing the back endorsing it versus actually running a business where you're signing the front as well. Yeah. I mean, there, there are small businesses that wake up January one, half a million dollars in the hole. In other words, they have $500,000 in commitments, whether it's furniture, fixtures, equipment, leasehold improvements, leasehold expense, you know, your rent, you've got the people puzzle of staff and salespeople, and uh, as well as insurance. I mean, there's things you don't think about. There's expenses that never stop coming. And their job is to earn enough income to overcome that fast enough before they lose money in December. Yeah. And so it's a different mentality when you wake up 500 grand in the hole versus at least starting at square one. There you go. All right. Uh, second test. Are you comfortable with public failure? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Not just <laughs> failure public failure, like yeah. full blown embarrassment. Uh, the world knows you failed. Yeah. And I, I think there's not a successful entrepreneur on the planet that hasn't failed a lot yeah. and can embrace that as part of the journey. And so if your D DNA is, is, has to be void of failure and you're quote a perfectionist and the, the way the world sees you is ultimately, you know, if it's, Always succeeding is the only way you'll exist. You're never going to make it as an entrepreneur. Yeah. I can't help but think of Elon Musk right now. And I'm not endorsing either direction, <laughs> but the dude is certainly uh, comfortable with public failure at the moment. Um, and, yeah. and, and I would label him an entrepreneur right or wrong. Right. But he certainly is experiencing some public failure. Um, but take it back down a notch. I mean, the thing is, is when your name is on the front of the check or your name is attached to the business or you're an entrepreneur, you're going to get all the glory when you win and you're going to get all the criticism when you don't. And I think that, that you're going to be comfortable with that. Yeah. It's part of the equation. Yeah. hundred percent. And there, and let's get real though. Not everybody's going to start SpaceX or, you know, Tesla or Facebook or my, you know, Microsoft. So there are levels of, of risk. And so I think franchise, there, there are reasons franchises exist. You know, you've got models and systems and accountability and all of those things lend to guardrails to protect those of us that are good at certain things and not all things. Because as an entrepreneur, you've got to either be good at or find people that are good at all things for a business to, to not just survive, but thrive. Sure. And so, and even sales, if you're an individual sales consultant, like in real estate, um, you're your own brand and you're still an entrepreneur, but that's a different path than, you know, some widely produced product that's international. There you go. Number three, it says, three. do you like to sell? And I don't think he means sell as in sell a product. I think what he's saying is when you're an entrepreneur, you're constantly having to sell the business, sell yourself. Talk to me. Well, it's vision. I mean, yeah. entrepreneurs sell vision long before they sell product or service. If you don't buy into the, it's like, what is it? Simon Sinek that said people buy the why before they buy the yeah. what? This is the why. You When you're an entrepreneur, especially if you're a single owner entrepreneur in sales where you are the brand, 
you're it. You're the why. You're the 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 you're the epicenter of the energy required for people to believe and buy into who and what you are. Absolutely. So you got to be able to sell yourself. And the ultimate promotion is your vision and capacity to impact people positively. So yeah. be clear on what that looks like. Yeah, we were uh, talking earlier as we were just kind of prepping. It was it's instead of selling the product, uh, you're actually selling something bigger. You're selling you're selling who you are. You're selling uh, a value proposition. You're selling a relationship, uh, something that has a bigger meaning. And you're constantly having to do that uh, because the industries always change and and people's perceptions and change is a constant. So you're not if you're not constantly out reselling, um, you think about Apple and how they have an annual conference. They are constantly having to reposition their products every year, right? Well, and as technology evolves, Brett, you have to wonder how many truly revolutionary products are left to be exposed. How many opportunities to bring something to market that's completely void of anything that's ever existed exists or will exist. And so the idea of reselling and repositioning, and this is a great point of of self-examination if you consider yourself an entrepreneur or in a um, an environment that's mobile or transitional is that am I evolutionary or revolutionary? And most products now are evolutionary. And what I mean by that is they're subtly better. It's like the new iPhone. It's, <laughs> I don't know about, I go in and I go, do I need a 15 now that I have a 13? And they're like, well, your megapixels go up one, you know, or whatever the number. But if you can't create a, an experiential image that's saleable, it's not selling. The guy actually talked me out of the 15 this week when I went in to get my 13 worked on because the plug wasn't working right. He cleaned it out. It works like a champ. And I said, <laughs> now, do I need a 15? The guy clearly didn't own Apple or he would have sold me a little harder. He's yeah. like, yeah, you could. And it, it was $750 more to trade up. And I'm like, yeah, I think I'll keep what I have for another minute. Yeah. But entrepreneurs, man, every day is a new opportunity to respin, reposition, and resell the value and virtue of what you offer. Yeah. You got to be good at it. You've got you to be, be really good, at, good it. at it. When the differences are subtle in competition, that's the real litmus. Yeah. And it's not always best product that wins. No. Sometimes it makes subtle look wins. really good. Yeah. Uh, fourth was how risk aggressive are you? We talk risk averse. Um, but risk aggressive to me means how aggressively do you go after taking risks? Yeah. And uh, I think your definition of an entrepreneur, if you reread it, it basically said it takes a, a, a larger than normal financial risk or something like that. I think you said. Yep. Yeah. I mean, are you burn the bridge, burn the boats? Are you that guy, you know, that sail to a foreign land and decide you're taking over and you're taking, you know, market share? Are you going to burn the boat so there's no escape clause? Or do you have a, you know, a, a boat in the wings waiting to sail back to safety? And if that's your mentality, I think the odds of succeeding go down. I think yeah. it's almost, you know, it, not no comparison to somebody who's all in do or die, who believes yeah. in what they're doing because there's a higher purpose and value in yeah. their minds. And that's a saleable vision. So I want to pull back from this conversation for a minute. Uh, it, and I'm not, I would never want to talk somebody out of being an entrepreneur. I want to talk people into clarity around entrepreneurship, right? So it isn't right for everybody because not everybody can handle public failure. Not everybody loves the process of selling themselves. Not everybody loves uh, the feeling of being risk aggressive or risk averse. Um, and, and I don't think anybody loves or hates, but there's certainly a, a feeling when you're signing the front of a check that uh, has some uh, liability to it and things like that. So it isn't right for everybody. So if you were going to give me advice and instead of a challenge today, I want you just to talk to me. How would you tell me to get clear on what an entrepreneur is and then whether or not I should step in or out of that conversation? Yeah, I think the starting place is to recognize your tolerance for that risk and the impact of making bets that you don't want to fulfill if it fails. If there's a if the if the failure is more powerful than the opportunity, you're probably not equipped to handle the rocky road that's ahead. Hopefully that made sense. In other words, if the risk 
if the risk is beyond your scope and that failure becomes uh, detrimental, permanently detrimental, or in a negative, you know, health relationship way, then you should probably find a way to find a seat on the bus that's an auxiliary or a companied role, a, a way to, you know, enhance someone else's entrepreneurial drive and skill. And the thing that I, I think we should get clear on is that just because you declare I'm not an entrepreneur, at least not in the purest sense of risk and tolerance for failure, that doesn't mean you can't behave entrepreneurially. That means nah. that, you know, you can still save effectively, invest effectively. You can buy stock. Ultimately, the reason people often want to be entrepreneurs is because they visualize owning the business as a leveraged place where you get, you can buy back freedom and time and retire wealthy. There's lots of ancillary businesses you can invest in. Let someone else take the risk. If you fail, you fail in small bites and not big bites. And you're not the one scrutinized publicly when things don't go exactly as planned. And so I, I think you need to get clear that being an entrepreneur um, definitionally means owning a greater percentage, but you can still win owning a smaller percentage of more pie or more pieces of, you know, more pieces, more pies, more diversity. That's what a balanced stock portfolio looks like. Yeah. Well, I think uh, it we we uh, make the word sexy, or we, if you will, or we we idolize the word. Yet, I'm not even sure uh, we could really clearly define it in most contexts. Right? It's just become a buzzword. But at the yep. end of the day, a real entrepreneur is probably somebody that owns a business, that runs a business, that handles liability, deals with risk. Uh, deals with failure, deals with success, right? But then there's, that's what the definition is, but then there's this journey to get there. What I'm hearing you say is there's a little bit of act as if on the journey to getting there, which is just a part of choosing entrepreneurial traits. Mm -hmm. Well, and so I'll add one last layer. Yeah. I think every organization needs more entrepreneurs in it to really thrive. You need people who are free thinking outside the box, and, and even if you're not signing the front of the check, you're committing to expenses and resources and investments on behalf of the company based on your expertise that really moves the needle. Yeah. And I believe that even inside of a W-2 job, there's room for financial Im improvement, encouragement, maybe um, uh, even stocks or equity at some point. If, you, if you're really that valuable to a company, you'll earn the right to, to ask for and receive opportunities. There you go. So I think it lives in both spaces and the, the, in part of entrepreneurs, just being open to the idea that change is good and opportunity lives on the other side of some risk and free thinking. There you go. Rick Hale, it is Mojo Monday, my friend. All right. Mojo Monday. Have a good <laughs> one. All right.